Hello friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Danny, and today we're gonna to be looking at my best books of 2023. Today I have narrowed my top books of the year down to 10 books. I think last year I only did five, but there's no way I could have done only five this year. Uh, there were a lot of five-star reads. I think I had 27 five-star reads total, um, and just so many amazing reads to choose from for this list. And so, and I'm sure on a different day, these rankings would be different, but this is what I'm going with. I'm going with my gut. Uh, and yeah, so I am excited to tell you guys about my top 10 books for the year. Starting at number 10, we have Mary by Nat Cassidy. I have currently read two of Nat Cassidy's books. I read Mary and then nestlings and both have been five stars this will definitely be a horror author that i am keeping on my anything that he comes out with i will be reading uh, list because i have absolutely adored both of his books so mary uh, i did like slightly more than i like nestlings uh, mary you follow a pre-menopausal woman who starts having hallucinations and is having a hard time with her her aging and um, she starts having hallucinations of these really gruesome murders and she goes to the doctor to try and figure out like if there's something wrong with her, what can she do? And her doctor essentially blames it on menopause. And so you have this, uh, discussion about women's health involved in the story, as well as, um, Mary also goes back to her hometown and, uh, there is a discussion of, your roots and hiding from and being uh, forced to be someone that you don't want to be um, by yourself or by those around you. And this, I just really, I loved the book's exploration of aging. And there are certain pieces that are very graphic. Mary starts having hallucinations, not only like whenever she is by herself, but whenever she is with someone, anytime, anytime she is looking at a woman, she sees them start to decay. And so there are discussions within that of essentially, she even sees herself decay in the mirror, um, letting go of beauty and youth and accepting yourself as you are and uh, being happy with your life but then also standing up for yourself and gaining confidence and being the person that you want to be. I, <laughs> which this doesn't even sound like a horror novel, <laughs> but it is, there's a creepy background uh, thing that's going on with her hallucinations and these women that are dying. And there is a backstory that you learn about pretty early on um, in this town of these women going missing. And I just, I really enjoyed it. It was, it, I don't, I don't even know what to say. So suffice it to say, I really enjoyed this story. I want to reread it. I think this is going to be something that maybe I reread every October. I, this is the only book on this top 10 list that I do not have a physical copy of yet. I've not been able to find one in a local bookstore. And so I'm kind of waiting, biding my time and seeing if it pops up somewhere. Um, but I will own it at one point in time and it will definitely be a reread. Number nine on this list is continuing with the horror genre in the September house. This book <laughs> is so funny, so witty. Uh, you follow a main character named Margaret who her and her husband decide to purchase a Victorian home. Uh, it is something that they've wanted to do for a really long time and they finally have the means to do it. Uh, and well, they have the means because this house is really cheap because <laughs> the house has been known to have some deaths in it and uh, they do not realize whenever they purchase it that it is haunted. And so they move in and definitely uh, some things start happening. And specifically in September, the house gets really gruesome and some really bad things happen in the house. But <laughs> unlike any other uh, haunted house book that I've had before, M Margaret decides this is my home, I'm not leaving. I don't care if it's haunted. And she just lives with it. And so you get to see all of these crazy things happening in the September house through Margaret's eyes in the sense of she's just gonna be stubborn and this is my dream home and I'm just gonna live with all the ghosties. Well, her daughter comes to visit her and her daughter does not realize that the house is haunted. And so um, there is this conflict of Margaret trying to protect her daughter from 
all of the kind of crazy things that are happening. Uh, there is an underlying story with why the house is haunted and what's going on with all the ghosties that are in the house. It is funny. It's gruesome. It's, I just, I absolutely loved it. I had such a good time. It's fast paced. Um, I know that some people did say that there was a lull in the middle. I did not feel that way. Um, but I know I've heard multiple people say that. So maybe it wasn't fast paced for everybody, but I just absolutely adored it. Number eight on this list is The Heir of Navron. This is the last book uh, in the Rayer Revelations. <laughs> Um, you follow Royce and Hadrian. I've talked about this series a lot on my channel, and since this is the finale of a series, I won't give you too much of the plot of this book. Um, but we follow Royce and Hadrian, who in the first book get hired to uh, steal something, essentially, or retrieve something. And it gets them involved in some kingdom politics that they really didn't want to be in. Um, but the, <laughs> the story is so much more massive than that. Um, you, one of the things that I really, really enjoyed about the series is the relationship between Hadrian and Royce and seeing these two men who are kind of rough and gruff and they are in a very gritty world, love each other, even if they don't say it. I just, I love seeing their friendship. I love seeing the pickle that they get themselves in and how they get themselves out of it or how other people help them get out of it. Uh, it was just fantastic. I can't wait to reread this. I am going to be starting the Rayera Chronicles next year, um, which I've heard is a like prequel series where you get to learn about Royce and Hadrian's relationship, I think is what that one's about. Um, I will let you guys know as soon as I pick it up. Number seven is The Tropic of Serpents. This is the second book in um, the Lady Trent memoirs. And I think it's the second or no, it's a, no, yeah, it's the second. <laughs> I was thinking it was the third, but it's the second. Um, I have given both of these five stars. I absolutely love Lady Trent's personality and the way that this book is written. So it is written as Lady Trent's memoirs. She is an, uh, older lady at this point in time in her life. And she is writing the travels that she went through as a young woman who wanted to study dragons in a world where women were really meant to just stay home and be safe. Uh, she kind of trudged her way through society doing what she wanted and studying what she loved. And these are the stories of how she got to where she is now as a renowned scientist uh, in this fantasy world. And I just absolutely loved it. I liked this the second one better than the first one and I just think the series is going to get better and better. The relationships that she has with the um, people in the surrounding areas that she goes to and this she spends a lot of her time in kind of a swampy area and there is a, a community of individuals who live in the swampy area who are uh, kind of oddities to the rest of the world. They definitely live a very harsh or in a very harsh uh, environment and so she learns to live with them. Think kind of Ace Ventura pet detective but not as comical um, and I guess more sincere uh, with her commitment to get to know uh, the people in the community. Um, I just, I really enjoyed it and I, I can't wait to continue the series. Number six is Thornhedge. I freaking loved this book. <laughs> Um, I've talked about it before on my channel. I did a vlog as I was reading through this. You follow Toadling, who is a fae-like creature who has been tasked with guarding a tower. And you don't really know why. You know that she is trying to prevent anyone from going into the tower, and she does this to the best of her ability. She gets to see kind of a history of the land that she is from uh, because she is there for a very, very long time just protecting this tower. She is super cute. Um, one of my favorite scenes in this is she's trying to convince this soldier to go on about his way and she decides that in order to do this, she's going to tie his hair in knots because that will that will scare him <laughs> into leaving. And I just, her backstory was very interesting. Um, I would love to see like a, a companion novel with this that actually either follows her as a child or follows the world that she is in as a child. The storyline behind who she is protecting or what she is protecting in the tower is very interesting. I I just, this was a, this was a blast. Uh, if you like fairy tale retellings, I definitely think this is one you should pick up. 
Continuing on with fae stories that I loved this year is my number five pick, which is Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. This book is just so darling, and I can't wait to continue with the series in January. I've already pre-ordered the second book in the series. I want to know what happens to Emily and Wendell and what they explore next. If you haven't heard of Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies, Emily is a scientist kind of, who is forming her own encyclopedia of the Fae. And she is, she has already searched out a whole bunch of different Fae species and is just compiling her knowledge. She's someone who does not like people. She really doesn't like social interactions. She's perfectly fine with just working and ignoring everyone around her. Whereas her colleague, Wendell, is someone who is very charismatic, kind of life of the party, and she believes at the very beginning of this book that she is going to this kind of isolated community to study the Dark Fae on her own. And Wendell ends up showing up. <laughs> and so you get to see their relationship grow throughout the story. You also get to see the kind of dark situations that Emily gets into with dealing with the Fae, because as we all know in Fae stories, sometimes Fae are not the nicest of creatures to interact with. Uh, some of them are, which is, I think is really interesting about the way that this story went about it is there are so many different species of Fae uh, that Emily is cataloging. Some of them are just tricksters and enjoy playing pranks on people and then there are others that are very very dangerous and Emily in studying them has uh, kind of allowed herself to be someone who can put herself in dangerous situations um, maybe not wisely <laughs> and hopefully can get herself out of them because of the knowledge that she has. I had a lot of fun with this and like I said I can't wait to continue. Number four on this list was my favorite book of the first half of the year, and that is The Magician's Daughter. I have talked about this a ton on my channel, and so I won't talk about it too much, uh, but I do want to give you a little bit of background just in case you didn't see that original video. So this follows Biddy, who is a girl um, who grows up on an island, kind of orphaned. She is taken care of by a magician. And on this island there is magic and so she grows up with all these magical beings and um, the magician whose name is Rowan has a familiar named Hutchincroft and uh, they have kind of been her family all of her life and she is I think a teenager in this story if I remember correctly and Rowan has has to leave the island to go and get supplies every evening and one evening he does not return and so Biddy has to make the decision to leave the island which she has wanted to do for a while but Rowan has forbidden it because the world is a dangerous place. Um, the world does not have access to magic and so her island is one of the locations in the world that actually still has magic. In most of the world the only people who have access to magic are the very very privileged and so she is in for kind of an eye-opening whenever she travels into the world to figure out how to help Rowan and what's going on um, and there's like a larger story going on as well. This cast of characters was so cute. The found f family elements between Biddy and Rowan and Hutch and Croft uh, just make my heart grow every time I think about it. This is another book I really want to reread in the new year. Um, I had a lot of fun with it. Number three on this list is Engines of Empire. And this is a book I haven't talked about much on my channel. I did talk about it on my chunky check-ins. Um, I just, I think it's kind of like that quiet creeper because <laughs> it ended up being number three on my list this year. I absolutely love this. This is a political fantasy. Uh, the second book in the series is called Engines of Chaos, which also came out this year and, or this, I guess, did not come out this year. It came out last year. But Engines, of, Engines of Chaos came out this year and then I believe next year the third book comes out. So I'm excited to continue with the series. You follow a noble family in this. You follow multiple POVs. You follow the mother, the daughter, and the two sons of this noble family. And what I think is really fun about this political fantasy is they all end up in different locations in the kingdom, and you definitely get to see how all of the cogs in the kingdom work. And um, <laughs> I don't know how much I want to give away. You get to see kind of how the kingdom was created, who is in charge, and some information about surrounding kingdoms that kind of put this empire in danger. And from each of their perspectives, 
you get to see, I kind of already said that, you get to see different pieces of the kingdom, but in, in such an interesting way. Like a lot of times whenever I see multiple POVs, they're in the same land and then they kind of all come together. I don't know how to describe it. This just like, they all have wildly different things going on in this book and it all seems to work together to help you figure out how this empire, this gigantic uh, kingdom works together. I just think it's absolutely fascinating. There are the the kingdoms that are not within like the actual empire you get to learn about. I think Tyretta, the, the daughter, was my favorite personality to follow in this um, because she ends up in kind of a forest area and you get to learn about some people who live in the forest. I just... <laughs> It was a lot of fun. It is super consumable as far as the writing style goes. It's very easy to read. Even though it is super chunky, it's not a very dense read. Uh, I found myself just flipping through pages as I was going through it. And yeah, I just, I, I really enjoyed it. I can't wait to continue the series. I bet y'all can already guess my top two reads of the year because you've probably already watched my ranking of new releases and the top two definitely didn't change. So, um, Yes, <laughs> let's get on with it. So number two on my list is the book that wouldn't burn. Oh, I just love this book. <laughs> I want to live in this world, um, kind of. <laughs> I obviously probably would not live if I was in this world, but you follow Lavira and Ivar are two main characters. You have two, PO two POVs, they are in two different locations. Lavira lives out in the dust and uh, is not protected by the city walls. And so her village gets attacked by the monsters that roam uh, at night. And Ivar lives in a library and cannot get out. He has lived there forever and there is essentially no way he is imprisoned in there. There is no way for him to exit the library. And their storylines and how they interweave uh, it's just really fascinating. The library in this book, if you guys have read Piranesi, the house in Piranesi, that is what the library in this book reminded me of. It is so massive, so ancient. There are discussions in this book of war and knowledge and uh, the importance of knowledge and the importance of understanding other cultures the way that the plot of this book interweaved and all connected at the end was just mm, chef's kiss. Like I, I freaking love this book. I don't know what else I can tell you <laughs> about uh, Lavira and Ivar. Lavira, you get a little bit more of her story in the beginning because of the fact that she does live in the dust. And so there's more of her uh, kind of traveling because of the fact that her uh, village does get attacked by monsters and within events she ends up in a city that kind of doesn't want her. She is known as a duster. Uh, the privileged people who live in the city really have isolated people who live in the villages outside of the city from themselves and so she has to deal with that dynamic and uh, Ivar has to live with Within the library, he has a family unit that he lives with, and there are certain things in the library that you can do, certain magic systems that exist in the library that you can use, and he has decided not to for reasons that you determine in the book. And so he kind of has to deal with that along with his trying to escape the library because of the fact that he has been, his family has been imprisoned there. And yeah, I just... I, this, the sequel to this comes out in April, so I have lots of series to look forward to next year. I can't believe it. Um, I can't believe it's coming out so soon, but I can't wait. And that leads us to my number one pick for this year, and that is The Will of the Many. <laughs> um, once again, this is a book I have talked about a ton on my channel, but I just can't get over it. And I do think the sequel to this also comes out next year. I can't remember what month. Uh, I'll have to look that up. But I am excited to read the sequel to this. This was one of, actually, the book that Wooden Burn was as well, one of the Goodreads Choice Awards nominees. And I was excited to see both of them on the list because they are very chonky. And uh, in this book, you follow a character named Vis, who is an orphan who lives in an orphanage and throughout the book you get to see both his past and his future. So you get to see where he comes from, why he's living in an orphanage, um, as well as why he has 
made some really difficult decisions in his life. He lives in a kingdom where they have a will-based magic system. And you, as a citizen of this kingdom, have to surrender a portion of your will to go towards the people who are in charge of the kingdom. And essentially it's this big kind of pyramid scheme where the people who are higher in the pyramid get more will pushed to them and so they are more powerful, they are stronger, they have the capability of wielding this magic that is taken from their underlings. And he, this, has decided that he's not going to participate in the system which is not really an option when you live in the kingdom. And so it has made his life a little bit harder and he is sought out by some people in the kingdom. He really just wants to kind of fade into the background and be forgotten. And of course, that's not in the cards for him. He gets plucked out of uh, where he is at and thrown into the chaos of this kingdom. There is a magical school in this. You get to see him get to know people in this kingdom that have very or that are very privileged and are put into positions of power and he gets to know them along with how the kingdom was created and you get to know his backstory as to why he really doesn't want to be a part of it i just the ending of this series i i want to know what's happening <laughs> the ending was one where i really you have an end and then you have, I don't know if they called it an epilogue, but you have like something that continues after like the official ending of the book. And that little something, it made me feel like I was reading um, like a sub story or a cutout, uh, like a cut scene that like a, a director would, would use. And I just, I want to know. I want to know what's happening. <laughs> I want to know what that had to do with the storyline and where it's going to go from here and what's happening with our main character. I want to know. I want to know the end. So this is my top book of 2023. Any of these 10 books were absolutely phenomenal and I had so much fun reading them. They would be contenders for rereads. I will say in the new year, and I'll talk a little bit more about this whenever I do my goals for 2024, I do want to focus on rereads. However, I don't want to reread books that are like first and second a series if I haven't continued the series, unless it's been long enough that I feel like I need to reread them to be, to enjoy the second or third book. But anyway, so <laughs> that's a little precursor to one of my goals that I'm going to create this year. So that is my top list of 2023. I know in my last video, I asked you guys to share your favorite books in the comments to give a little bit of positivity to my worst books of the year, but I'm going to ask you to do that again. Are there any books that you did not share with me in the last video that were your top favorites of this year? Or if you did share with me your favorites last uh, in the last video and you would like to share something different, tell me an anticipated release that you are expecting for 2024 that you are really excited about. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you have a lovely evening and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.